As always, thank all of you for coming out on this uh, rainy afternoon. Uh, it's a huge honor and a privilege again to have you all in person. And without you, this event uh, would not be possible, of course. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Adeline, and all of you for being here. Um, a lot of you might realize that the, um, the family holding structure is very common in Asia. And I think Credit Suisse ran a study some years ago. And they noted that I think 80% of most ASEAN economies are SME. And a large portion of those SME businesses are family-owned structures, right? So which makes it all the more germane that we've got someone like Richard Yu to talk about his experiences. An oft-quoted refrain of the family holding structure is the three-generation curse, beyond which uh, the, the downline, shall we say, would have fitted away or sold off the business. You know, you're the fourth generation in just 143 years, right? Which is testament to your family's longevity. I think your father uh, was 99 before he uh, hit his final bat at the, at the innings. Um, but perhaps you can talk about how the Yu family managed to break the curse, which is obviously something which everybody aims for in the family structure. Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. It's good to be back in KL after three years. And I used to come here almost every month. But uh, anyway, um, I think that uh, the three-generation curse almost hit us. Um, my, my grandfather was the second generation and he established a very substantial business uh, starting in, in uh, what was that, Malaya. Uh, and basically our family are, are tin miners. That's why we, uh, Yuan Sang started in uh, Goping, which is the heart of the Kinta Valley, right? And um, so he, the main business was actually tin mining and, and uh, but my great grandfather had started the uh, Yuan Sang business to bring in herbs for the workers as a form of health care for them because there's no there's actually no medical care in the, in the in the mining fields back then so they had to depend on any alternative kind of treatment to uh, the main I suppose the main medicine they used back then was opium. Which, yeah, um, and um, I guess I don't know if you all know much about the history uh, that opium was was the way in which the British Empire actually made quite a lot of its uh, fortunes. And back then, every business needed a license, uh, and it, they called revenue farms. And so, whatever revenue farm you got whether it's tin mining or anything else, um, the government, the colonial government, would also make the, the, uh, the license holder take a revenue farm for opium as well. So this is how um, the workers basically had to depend on opium um, for, for their health needs. Mainly pain management, I would say, you know, because the... And then you became addicted and so on. So my great-grandfather wanted to find an alternative way to break that. And that's how he brought in these herbs from China and started the first shop, which was called Yansang in Goping. And um, so as my grandfather inherited that business and expanded his own business empire down all the way down to Singapore, he would open a Yansang shop next to whatever uh, offices he had. So from from the Goping, Kampa, Ipoh, down to KL, Saramban, and into Singapore, and then up to Hong Kong and China, to, to, uh, to Guangzhou. Um, the intent was, alongside the other business, was also to serve the needs of uh, some of these uh, the workers. So uh, Yan Sang at that time, besides bringing the herbs from China, also did remittances back to China for the workers. Because again, there was no formal banking system that the workers had access to. And uh, money was remitted through these informal systems. Even today, I think goldsmith shops and things like that do that, the remittances. And that was part of what uh, Yuan Sang used to do. And it was a quite a substantial part of Yuan Sang's business. But going back to the third generation curse, after my grandfather passed away, at the outbreak of the Second World War, um, we basically, the, the, the family had to regroup coming back. 
uh, from the war. And uh, the, the government at that time also imposed uh, very punitive death duties on large estates. And <clears throat> if you recall back then, the maximum rate of income tax was 55%. So they imposed the highest rate of 55% on the value of the estate on, based on the day that my grandfather passed away um, and added interest on top of that for the years that it had not been paid, which could not be paid because of the war. So by the end of the 1940s, um, my father's generation was basically presented with a huge tax bill. And so a lot of assets had to be sold off just to pay that. And it was sold off at very low prices because who wants a few shop houses here and there, you know, and things like that. So um, that was one of the factors that to, to some extent led to a decline of the, of the family businesses. And, um, but they managed to keep some of it. And so uh, it went through the third generation until uh, most of it was sold off. So we had the tin mines with proper estates, who had a bank. <clears throat> and the only thing that was left was Yuan Sang. So uh, I guess that's, that's my starting point, was to see what we could do with uh, what the family left us. So the traditional reason or the historical common reason for <coughs> family structures to disintegrate would be to have squabbles between the, the cousins and, and the family members. In your case, it was because of um, quite draconian uh, taxes by the government. But the net result is the same. You, you lost control of the business, right? So according to history, according to folklore, um, you family's holding of the business has been uninterrupted, un except for one period, I think in the 90s, when you and your cousins got together to buy back the shares. So, so, so your case is quite unique and maybe in quite instructive for other family uh, structures as well. Can you talk through that period? Um, actually, family squabbles were laid on top of those problems. So because my grandfather had 13 sons, and uh, the 13 sons came from different mothers, there were different factions amongst the sons, and uh, the estate was divided fairly equally amongst all 13 of them. So nobody had a major share. And so it's up to the different factions to try and group together. Uh, and that's why it was the easiest thing to sell everything off rather than to try and cooperate. And with the Yuan Sun, part of the, well, we were lucky in the sense that the Singapore Malaysia part was listed in the early 70s. And uh, Hong Kong was listed in the very early 90s. So there was some structure there. But um, when there was succession being talked about, my uncle was executive director of Yuan Sang, and he wanted to retire at the age of 70. Um, I put my hand up to, at that time I was 40 something years old. And I, and I said, I have enough working experience. I think I can run this business. Some uncles got very jealous and they organized a sellout. So they sold us out to a company called Lam Chang in Singapore. And um, long story short, they didn't want the business, they wanted the, the shell, the listed shell. And they said, look, we, only, we don't want you want the business. We will try and we'll sell you the business when we're ready. So they injected other assets into the company and sold the business to my cousins and I in Singapore. Yeah. So what is the idiot's guide to, um, what is the idiot's guide 101 to solving family holding structures, to addressing family squabbles? How, how do you advise the plethora of family structures around Asia today? There's no single solution. So every family has a unique situation. Um, if you're first generation passing to second generation, that's probably the easiest because that's just very small number of beneficiaries. But as you go along and you've got cousins and second cousins and so on, then it becomes more difficult. And people try and put together certain structures, as you said, you know, either they are holding companies or trusts and so on, to try and, um, try and find a way to own those uh, assets without having to break them all up. Um, that's generally the intent. Having seen what happened in my family, I think that the, um, in a way it's almost impossible as, as the family gets bigger 
if you want, to, if everyone wants to have a slice of it, you know, if you're willing, there are many different models amongst the European families as to how that's done, which include things like none of the family works in the business, nobody takes any dividends and so on. They just keep the business going as is. You know, other other families in Europe, um, there's one case where in each generation, only one member of the generation owns the entire business. They sell the whole business to one guy. And then the one guy has, has to pay his predecessor from the earnings. And then he sells it on from there. Yeah, so these are different models that go on. I mean, so we haven't, I think we haven't reached that level of um, maturity yet to, to see those kind of models. Yeah, I think one of the... Um well, one of the reasons why people don't do those structures is the lack of liquidity. You might own something which is worth hundreds of millions or, or billions, but you can't sell those shares necessarily because you've got to keep it within the fold. The thing is, um, do you need to be a politician to manage, you know, um, quite, quite, quite demanding family members? Because it's, it's one skill to run a business. It's quite another to appease family members. How, do you need to be a politician, Richard? I think so, um, to some extent. Because you've got Clifford on board and, you know, yeah. your, your cousins at the stage, right? Um, but we were lucky already, just having two cousins, three cousins. But I, I was brought by my father to the family meetings when I was much younger. And I watched what went on there. And that was awful. Because uh, there's 13 people around the table. And each one had a different point of view. There's my, the smarter uncles were actually the younger ones. And the older ones wouldn't acknowledge that the younger ones were, were smarter, so they blocked everything. So this was the, the dynamics within the family. And then threw another factor in, which was... I want to try to put this politely. Spouses. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy wife, happy life, right, Richard? Well, um, you know, in, in our case, um, uncles passed away, and the spouses their place at the table. And that was even worse. Right. So 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 you you talked about how you, you had been listed in, in Hong Kong and in Singapore. And I think your your recent your last foray was in Singapore's SGX in 1990. Institutionalizing the shareholding structure uh, might might give liquidity and structure to the to the framework. But it also means the entry of uh, un, un, unwanted third parties and hostile takeovers and all that. You have told me in, in the holding room that you'll never ever countenance another public listing before uh, again in the future. Talk about the whole listing process. What are your pros and cons? I think the listing was actually um, done in order to provide some kind of liquidity. <clears throat> liquidity is good if you need it, right? And if you really do want to sell, it's a way of indicating the market value of the company. But as you know, our markets here are not that fantastic so what do you the, mean by that richard uh liquidity <laughs> the the the, <laughs> oh, the, the amount of yeah, yeah okay okay the depth and breadth of the market yeah yeah singapore so, or malaysia Sing we're talking about singapore okay and um so what happens is that actually you don't feel that the the, the market prices well would you, would you sell at all if you you know if you if you sell would you sell at a particular point in time and would you be able to find a buyer at that price because if you have high expectations the buyers have want to have a cheaper price so there's always a standoff so if you talk about selling as a block it's much more harder if you're talking about just um having a a, a, a liquid a, a share that's liquid that's able to trade and for people to trade in it that's okay but it doesn't really benefit your family because you don't intend to sell or you want to sell, you sell in one block, right? So what's the advantage of being listed other than to have a number to your wealth? You can measure a, a, your wealth by saying, okay, you've got X number of shares in this company and the market cap is so much, you're worth so much. But apart from that, you know, it's, I think that's a bit of an ego trip, you know, and I, I'm not sure what benefit it, it, it is. Uh, you know, if we want to sell, I would say actually, for most businesses, a trade sale is better than a listing. A trade buyer will pay more. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, obviously markets are driven by sentiment and markets, especially public markets, are driven by forward sentiment. So the better your merchant bankers, 
maybe the better your multiple. So it's interesting that they say a trade sale is might get you a higher valuation. Yeah, you can you can base the trade sale on a market on the market price as well. I mean, of course, you there are companies that will buy listed companies, right? And then the market price is an indicator of the value, but in most cases, it's always above the market. Of course, so you don't, you don't get a trade sale of someone below market unless that company is in really bad shape. Yeah, right. But so in that case, why bother to even have a market price at all? So in that room earlier, when we, before we came out here, you talked about how your biggest reluctance, where public markets are concerned, was, was not any of the what you just mentioned, but you mentioned that you didn't like public markets because they're more today interested in form yeah. over substance. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so when you're a public company, the, nowadays you get more and more governance issues and you have to comply with a lot of things, right? And uh, to a large extent... The regulators are always behind the ball. The, the smart operators know how to manipulate, you know, based on the existing regulations. Then by the time they've done it, they've manipulated the market. Then the, the regulators will come in and, and write new laws to try and plug that hole. But it, you know, we see it happen. Uh, you know, for I, I was my I started working in the early seventies. And uh, there were great market players in those days, right? Nowadays, the laws have changed to try and stop what those guys were doing in terms of creating false markets and all the rest. But it still happens. You know, if you have the intent to, to cheat people, there's always a way to do it. You could say the same thing happens in the private equity markets as yeah. well, though, Richard. But what is your advice to entrepreneurs who are reaching a certain maturation in their life cycle? which then, you know, they've got to decide whether to do a trade sale or a public listing, uh, which markets and, you know, all, the, all these issues in their mind. It depends what their need is. So if you, uh, re- if you require capital for the business, you do a round of fundraising, right? You, and of which an IPO is one, op- one option. If you want to exit, that's a different uh, thing altogether. So you can either, yes, you can exit by going public. You can exit by selling to somebody. So yeah. if you describe you what you want. Yeah. the SGX as, a, as I, I guess, a little bit thin on depth and breadth, what more Jakarta, Hong, uh, KL, Thailand, and, and the Philippine Stock Exchange? Not, not great, obviously, right? So, so then you've got to prepare your, your company for a, for a Hong Kong listing at the least or, or a New York listing or a London listing, right? So, so what does it take to be to, to get to that level? Size. Size. You've got to have big market cap. So I think for all the regional markets, they are beneficial for the players who want to create you know, opportunities to make money within the volatility of those markets. But if you want to have a serious uh, public listed company and you're going for the even Hong Kong, I would say New York, London, Tokyo, that sort of size. Uh, you need a certain you know, market cap to get there. So here's a conundrum. Yeah. If you want to grow fast, well, if you want to go get big, right? It's you get that fast or you get that slow. Slow is organic, fast is acquisition. Acquisition means you've got to have ammunition. Ammunition typically means equity capital, right? Selling shares. So then that dilutes the family structure which a lot of family members won't do that, right? So how do you address that? I think you look, you look at the, um, the intent again, right? And my general advice would be, and I tell this to my children, is that we are not a family business. We're a business family. Because the business might change, but the family stays. So you might, be able, you might have to sell the business or you, you might want to sell the business at some stage, but you can still you still have the family and you can create other businesses along the way. And that's happened with some families. There, there, are, there are families whose original business was something very different. And uh, today, you know, they are in a totally different uh, business altogether, but several generations old. And, and then you've got the, the other kind of family structures where they have nice assets uh, private and other assets public. And then there's obviously... There's, some, there's sometimes a, uh, uh, you know, transactions between, you know, obviously then they call it related party, la, which then gives you a, a rather bad smell. And we're not going to mention which companies in Malaysia. Uh, it happens all the time. Yeah. So, so then, but let's fast forward, right? So now you've got 
Tomasic on board as a shareholder. And these guys would be the blowers of the blue blood kind of like investment firms. The kind that you want to have because that validates the model. Having them on board means you then are able to pick and choose who you want on board as well. Then you've also got Tower Capital. Ta Tower Capital investment firm as well, right? Yeah. What do these guys demand of you? Um, basically, they want to, in a way, keep what we created in the, in the business, but to be able to add their own values in terms of uh, the value add, right? What, what can we get out of a Tower Capital or a Tamasic? They, because they, they own many different other companies as well, particularly in Tamasic's case. So they can teach us um, how we should structure certain things. How should our HR be run? How you can help us hire people? And this, this kind of thing, you know. Um, I think their advice in certain instances has been quite useful. But what do they demand of you, Richard? Because for me, that, if, no, if, if, if you decide to stay private, yeah. which means you won't go public for the foreseeable future, right? So, so other than the dividend income which they might receive on an annual basis, what, what else do they get from you? Cache, maybe? Uh, um, brand, brand equity? Some, something to talk about on ESG terms? What? I think the debate is more within Tomasic in this one. Because Tower, probably at the end of the day, they might they probably want to cash out, being an investment company. They're not a PE as such, but um, they may at some stage want to sell just because that's the business they're in. They buy and then eventually they sell. Uh, in Tomax, Tomasic's case, do you think that they would sell Singapore Airlines? Right. If, if you look at if if they look at uh, Yuan Sung as a Singapore brand, you know, uh, is it something that they actually would they part with it? Is it? I I don't know the answer, right? But I think the reason why we brought in Tomasic and we at that stage we sold out. Uh, part of our shares because my cousin wanted to sell, Clifford wanted to sell out. So we had to look for someone to come in as a partner. Uh, and so we say, who should we look for? And we, we actually went through several rounds with different uh, private equity firms. And both of them, are, I, it's, they're very hard to deal with. And my, then my father said, look, seriously, I think if you can't get Tamasic in, don't bother to do anything else. So, so we talked to, to Tomas and they, they agreed to come in. But I, I know that they're not going to be there forever, necessarily. Well, but they might. I mean, it's, intri might, yeah, it's intriguing know. that Tomas sees you as a Singapore asset, yeah. given the fact that you're actually founded in Gopeng. Uh, but it's, of course, a story for another day. Um, let, let's, move, let's move along, right? So, so what you talked about uh, on our call a few weeks ago, you, you talked about how um, during the height of COVID, you actually saw a huge spike in demand for your traditional Chinese medicine products. And this is on the back of, of, of people like Pfizer and you know, AstraZeneca and all these other guys making a, a ton of cash. I, I think last year, Pfizer booked revenue of 35 billion US dollars, highest in the history by some margin, right? Why do you think that happened? Um, I think in Malaysia, we were in a unique situation at that point in time that uh, there wasn't enough. Uh, there weren't enough vaccines at that, right at the beginning, and so uh, consumers were looking for any kind of alternative to help with the uh, effects of contracting COVID. It's not a preventative per se. Although you can take, sure you can take herbs to to boost immunity and all that. But actually, people who got sick, what do they do? And even until today, the the drugs that you have. Uh, vaccines, which is to prevent, but there are very not too many drugs for post uh, COVID for recovery from COVID. And what they have, I think Pfizer's got one, which is very very expensive. You know, so at that time, people were looking for our herbs to moderate the effects of uh, of COVID, and we did have this this uh, particular product, which we had created uh, quite a few years back for SARS. And uh, that product was actually then became very popular. It got sold out straight away. It, it was all. It was. Uh, we didn't even market it. It was. It was all viral. You know. Well, anecdotally, uh, and anecdotally is not scientific, but anecdotally, a lot of people saw traditional Chinese medicine and Western pharma medicines as, as a binary decision. 
they either took Western medicines or they took TCM. Yeah. They, they rarely, to me, in Malaysia at least, they never rarely took both. And, and that seems to me a little bit like what's happening in the world today, where Asia seems to be decoupling from the West. Certainly in China's case, that is, the, that is happening. And there's a kind of like a repudiation, if you like, of Western philosophies and Western concepts. What do you think about that? Maybe a bit more extreme in, in China's case, but we see ourselves as complementary and not alternative. So I think if you, you get the vaccine and you still get COVID, which is quite possible, I got COVID twice. So um, you can take herbs to help moderate the effects. And um, anecdotally, there's no clinical studies of this one because we, we can't actually do anything on this. But anecdotally, um, it does help a lot. So in my case, uh, the first time I got COVID was the Delta. And um, so I, I, actually, once I tested positive, I took a herbs and I, I had very, very mild side effects. I had a mild headache for two days. Well, you, you might, you might, yeah. you, your public message to the world might be that Yu Yang Zhang is complimentary. Co that's, that's exactly the position I exactly. would take, yeah. Which, which, is, which is conducive from a business standpoint. Yeah. yeah. But from a customer standpoint, they, they are, it's actually quite binary, yeah. you know. But, um, when I, but when I saw the doctor after I got tested, I did PCR and all these things, he said, Okay, so I'm positive. At that time, I just got vaccinated, you know, so the vaccine hadn't taken root. But, so I said, what, what would you suggest I do? So she said, oh, take some Panadol. And I said, no, that's fine. I got Panadol at home. I don't need a prescription for Panadol. So I went back and took our herbs instead. But there's, in, in Western medicine, there was very little uh, that people could take to moderate the, the effects, the symptoms of getting COVID. And the second time I got I tested positive, I didn't even know I had it. Yeah. Okay. Like that was the, that was the uh, Obicron. So the therapy. moral of the story is yeah. take both. Take both. I think you, you should get vaccinated. Okay. And I think there's many, I've, I've heard all the different opinions about vaccination, but I believe that uh, vaccination will help. Um, all our life from young, we've been vaccinated. We start with the BCGs and we go on to the, course, all the rest of, of it. And, you know, uh, we had what uh, cholera vaccinations and all that. Or, you know, all our life we, we have vaccinations. Yeah, so, so we've got our scars on our arms. Yes, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's 4.32 now. Uh, 4.32 is when we light the fire under your chair. Okay. And uh, we, we try and warm the seat up because it's actually quite cold. So the first question actually comes from the audience. And in essence, that person is asking, why should a non-family member has joined your family business because there's a risk always that a family member will get promoted ahead of them despite their best efforts. How would you respond? Again, it depends a lot on, the, on that business. It doesn't happen in our company because I never had many family members uh, anyway. And it was understood that it's not an iron rice boat that we would give to any family member. Um, my grandfather, in fact, depended on professional managers to run all his businesses. Uh, and all the way through, basically, we've had uh, professional managers running various parts of the business. So I think we've never had a case where a family member was promoted over a non-family member. Uh, when I went into the business, I replaced my uncle uh, as executive director, but actually there's nobody. We looked, because I was an alternative director to my father at that time, and we looked at, there's nobody inside the company that was able to to step up to become the next, uh, to be the managing director. And so I said, look, I'll do it. You, you don't have to pay me any uh, high salary. I just take whatever is given and um, let me try and give it a go. And that was how I got into the company. Even though after that, my uncles were still not happy. But yeah, I don't. I think, and, and ever since then, all of the business I was before Clifford joined, um, I was the only one from the family in the business. So it was all professional managers. So in institutionalizing the hierarchy, yeah. did you procure um, external consultants, whether it's Thomas Watson or whatever, or was it done internally from an internal, you know, peer review? Both. Both, yeah, we had different consultants at different times. And we looked at, uh, we always try and build up that second layer, right? Uh, the, 
because we operated by having uh, business units which are subsidiaries, so the heads of those business units uh, then have in turn have to look for their own successors. Yeah, and they're all non-family. So obviously, 143 years, four generations. You know, um, there must have been down days. Um, so someone in the audience is actually asking, um, what it was was there at any point in time you felt that um, you know maybe you should fold the cards uh, or, or close the business down because uh, things were too tough. What were those down days like? It's hard to answer about the time before me. During my time, I didn't actually have that feeling that it was so it was so tough that I had to throw in the chips. Um, I think the worst the worst thing that happened was waking up being told that you've been taken over. Right. This so, is the Lam Chang days. Yeah. So the day, the morning, I mean, I cannot forget. Right. The phone rings eight thirty in the morning. The merchant bank calls. Is we just been received a notice of takeover from Lam Chang. You are now owned by Lam Chang. So they had majority. They over fifty percent. Okay. So how did you beat that? So initial shock, right? I mean, oh, what's going to happen? Is the uncertainty? Um, Lam Chang turned out to be very decent people. They came to see us. They said, "Look, we're not really interested in your Chinese medicine business." We were looking at all the other assets. We were looking at the listing, and um, at that time, our profits from the TCM business was very small. So they said, "We sell one apartment. We make as much as you do in one year." So they said, "Fine." So they said, "When we're ready to sell, we'll give you the first right." That's what happened. So it was the best thing that happened at the time, but it was really traumatic when you're told that you've been bought out. But what it, it just eventually became a corporate finance solution, now, right? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Well, which which is actually quite easy. Yes, the largest exactly. Things, right. Yeah. Um, again, from the audience, um, do you think that your grandfather, your you know, um, father, grandfather would have done, could have done things differently, if, if faced with the same problems? I think that um, they would face different problems at different times, right? So, what did you do during the Great Depression or whatever? What you know, um, wars, what happened with the war. Um, they, they would have faced different problems. I guess they were able to deal with it at that time. To a large extent, in my father's generation, the best thing they did was actually to do nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, you know, on high side. If they try to... If they try to uh, to interfere too much or try to think around too much. Again, the, you know, but that was at that particular time, right? So here we are in the 1950s and 60s. They didn't expand the business. The business was very steady. Um, we generated pretty much the same revenues and same profits year after year. So for the family, it was just a cash cow. You know, small, but still there. They just they won't show what to do with it, so they decide. Okay, in nineteen seventy three, whatever, we'll we'll list the Singapore Malaysia. It's a very small list uh, list co. Um, but at least we it made that asset liquid, which was at that time part of the intention was that those family members who wanted to sell could then sell it if they wanted to, and um, so by so thirteen shareholders. You know, some of them sold, uh, basically sold to each other. You know, and then and, um, and some some outsiders bought as well, which was a, which is the reason why when Lam Chang came in, they were able to get a block of shares, which were also held by non-family. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, some some people say that you know we're we're on the verge of uh, this this war, this this transition between the U.S. and China, and there's going to be all kinds of things happening in the world. Uh, what what do you make of that? We're kind of the meat in the sandwich here, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, being in, in this part of the world. Yeah. And uh, we have to. I think these are events beyond beyond us as a company. Can we survive what happens? I, I think we're not involved in anything to do with war or whatever. We're not defense industries. We're not in critically sort of strategic industries. I think the, the the business can continue. We may have to readapt 
based on uh, circumstances. If there is going to be war here, if there's, I don't think it's, I seriously, I don't think there's going to be war. Why don't? Why not? I, my feeling. Okay, so it's, I, it's a sense, I, yeah. I, yeah, I think too much to lose. It's brinkmanship right now, and um, oh, this is my own personal feeling. I, firstly, I think the Chinese are smarter than that. They're not going to be sucked into a war by the Americans. That's that's my feeling. So I, but I think there's going to be brinkmanship here, right? Um, we all want a good outcome, but the outcome that the Americans want is different, right? Because they want to continue their domination, and it's true. I mean, you're if you're a dominant power and you look at you're going to lose it, you do whatever you can to retain. I think that's the psychology behind what's happening. In China, I think, on the other hand, I don't know what happens with uh, Xi Jinping today, but China always, has always played the long game. You know, China has been around for a long time. It will continue to be around. They're going to just be patient about this, I think, right? So, in relation to that, you know, what you just talked about, what appears to be quite a simple question, which is actually quite profound, yeah. asking of you, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge of modern life, Richard? I, I think, um, I, I mean, I look at my children and see what stresses them out. What stresses them out? Yeah, I mean, what's the challenge, right? So it's, I think everyone faces the same thing. How do you raise your children? How do you have a family? How, how would you, what's the, um, what's, what's, what, what do you, how do you define what your life should be? And there are all these big issues. So for me, at my age, some of these issues are not going to be so relevant, but it's going to be relevant, re relevant for my children and their descendants, like climate change and all that, right? So I think it's not going to impact me as much as it might impact my grandchildren. So they've got to, but it's good that they're talking about it now, but they're thinking about it. So you look at the millennials of today, what bothers them? And these are the issues, you know, um, environmental, you know, the, the, the whole uh, sustainability, all that sort of thing. Uh, I think I think they they are worried about this because they know that this is their future. If they don't do something about it now, then they don't have a future. Just on the subject of children, because obviously you guys at Yu Yan Sang, you would have made your money a long, long time ago, right? Which then introduces an element of maybe a lethargy, or uh, you know, motivational issues, or you know, um, I mean, when you you know your great grandfather Yu Kong came over from China, and you know he came with nothing, right? And he's he, he with blood, sweat, and tears. That is his pure hunger. Four generations later, there's a ton of ma money in the kitty. How do you keep it alive? I think the um, the motivation has to be different. You cannot tell your children, "Oh, if you don't work properly, you're gonna starve." You, you know, you actually that's a lie. Yeah. It's a lie, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can throw them on the out on the street if you want to, but most parents are not going to do that. So most parents who are in sort of within a comfortable environment, right? They families who have enough money. I'm not saying you have to be super rich, but if you're comfortable, how do you motivate the next generation to do something? But um, the way that I see it is that you you the motivation is no longer about survival. The motivation now is purpose. You've got to instill the purpose in the next generation. Why are we here? What are we doing this? If we have all this money, what are we going to do with it? This is a responsibility. You know, you've got to let them think in those terms rather than just say, oh, you know, yeah, we've got so much in the bank and you can go and blow it on buying Ferraris or whatever it is, you know. Right? I mean, I, I, I mean, to me, uh, I just in my, my personal, you know, for me on a personal basis, I think the motivation was really to try and continue that legacy which my ancestors had had given us, which which was to help people. This is the purpose of Yuan Sang was 
my great grandfather started to help his coolies, and I think today the greatest thing that I can, I can, greatest compliment I, I would get is someone comes up to tell me to say that your products or your services help me, you know, whatever it might be to get over my COVID or to fix my cough or we have clinics as well and we have a good natural fertility practice in those clinics. So you see a wall full of baby pictures in our physician's office. I tell you, that's really gratifying. So I mean, that, that, that keeps me going. So to make sure that you, Yan Sang, last another 143 years and beyond, do you double down on traditionalness? Do you double down on your core principles? Or do you, uh, how do you digitize, modernize, you know, play that game? Yeah. It goes back to your purpose. So the forms will change. The products have changed. I mean, what we sell today is very different to what we sold 100 years ago. But the intent has to be there. We are still there to help people deal with their health needs or whatever it might be, right? So, and that would, the needs would change, but you have to keep current with all that, you know? So just, just, I um, mean, I suppose you just have to understand what are the current needs and that's how you keep your, your, your business, your, your customer base. You know, you can't do just the same thing over and over again and expect people to follow you, right? I think you have to follow them. So that process actually is actually quite existential and very important to the survival of the business, right? Yeah. Do you do that? How do you do that? How do you, what is the process? Is it external, internal, or is it internal? How many people? What is the process? I think, um, and that's, this is where I think when we bring in the partners and the professional managers, they have to keep thinking about this all the time. So it's not just within the family. I think it's, this is a company wide thing, right? So I think you, you how I do it, I keep questioning. So every time we have the workshops and so on within the company, we keep asking all these things. What's relevant? You know, what are we, are we missing anything today? Um, going digital, for example, right? We try to do this a long time ago. Thanks to COVID, that's taken off. Yeah. What so, worked? What, what worked on the digital, you know, yeah, um, I mean, plan? So, I think COVID has shown us that, um, well, we knew this before, but I think it's proven to us now that um, the, the model for us, has, we are going to change from being a, a pure retail business into uh, a more product type business. And product meaning that we create the products for the customer base and we sell the products through what, we, what they call omnichannel today, right? So you, you omnichannel. Regardless, omnichannel. Okay. So okay. regardless of where, you, those products are able to reach the people, the customer base. So, so how do you build a brand? What is the, I mean, that's obviously a very yeah, big question, yeah, yeah. big answers, right? Yeah. How do you build a brand that stands the test of time that people think about, you know, on first reflex? <laughs> I, just, it's, I can't give you a short answer to this one. I think um, the ultimate aim is a brand. What does a brand mean? Brand means uh, top of mind awareness. So what have you done to make people think of you in your category, right, first, right? What is it? What are those um, attributes that make people think of that, your name? And I think you start from there and then you work. And you see what you need to do in order to, to do that. So it's not just throwing money into advertising. That's, you know, if you don't... Have, you don't think about how to, you, you call it building the brand. You, you have to build up your, your customer base. Your customer base then become advocates to bring in more customers and so on. So this is a, it's a very long-term thing. You, can't, you can throw billions of dollars in, in marketing costs and to, tr to try and build something up. But a lot of the times, um, it doesn't stick if you don't have something really uh, substantial behind that the intent. Did you ever think that you, Yan Sang, was too oriental, too Chinese, too Eastern, you know, to break Western markets, you know, yeah. to penetrate US? Yeah. Did you ever think about that? Yes, yes, many times. So, is a Chinese name uh, going to be recognized in the Western markets? I still don't have the answer today. We tried different things. We, we tried buying Western brands, Western companies with the Western names and try and 
uh, use our products, use our products in, with those names in one form or other. Um, some Westerners tell us they're not an issue for them to to use a product that's got an Oriental name. Uh, some people might say, I, I you know, it's hard to we don't know how to pronounce it and and so on. You know, but if they don't see this is through consumer research that we've done. Um, if they see our stores, they, there's some correlation between the name and, the, and our image and what we stand for. So through that, uh, we know that um, all races can accept. But if you're online and you're trying to attract customers online, just all you have is that name on the website, then it's, I think it's harder. So I don't have an answer yet. I think maybe for us, what we're doing, we, our online sales have gone up internationally, uh, even during COVID, because people are looking for remedies, or alternative remedies, right? Uh, so I think they are willing to accept that if your product comes from Asia and it's oriental, it's fine to have an oriental name, right? Yeah, okay, we've got a couple of minutes before we break into the Q&A, right? Um, you've talked about many business principles. You've talked about size, you know, obviously mattering. You talk about playing the long game. You talk about uh, maybe a little bit of a disdain for the public markets. You've talked about, you know, institutionalizing the hierarchy, you know, the your organizational structure. You've talked about using external parties to try and come to, you know, quite germane business decisions. Do you have the top three business principles, Richard, which, which you can impart to entrepreneurs? You know, the top three principles that, you know, is the, is the go-to formula. Apart from the sort, of, the sort of core values that we have, I mean, the basic principle is, is the golden rule, right? That you have, to, you have to behave the right way to, to the person you do business with. You expect that they will also treat you in the same manner. So this uh, reciprocity is very important. And you don't have to do business with everybody. You do business with people that can respond to you in the like manner. There's business opportunities every day, everywhere. You, you can't grab them all, right? And so this is a lesson that um, one of my mentors, my, actually my father's very good friend who's American, and he was the one who told me, he says, you're going to see this every day. Just do business with people that you trust, you know, and then you do you have less problems, you know. So that and it's that's useful advice, but not everyone's going to follow that, you know. Unfortunately, I think um, just I think be less less greedy about it, about it and just try and think of um, what's smoother, you know, rather than to try and do everything the hard way. Is that rule two and rule three? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, integrity is extremely important. So our business will not survive if people didn't trust us, and we have to live up to that trust. So uh, uh, this was something that's um, luckily even my father's generation, they all accepted this. That this was people bought our products because they knew that the U family isn't going to cheat them. That's very important. So you stand by your, and here you put your name on the line. What you know, as and, the, and I think with the with the old family and the old business, the longer it goes on for, the more important that becomes, because you you can't destroy the the hundred years of heritage that you had by by cheating people, you know. So that burden becomes heavier. But and this, so this is what you have to instill in that next generation, you know, the the. This very strong belief in in, uh, in integrity, you know. So I think that's the number two rule. You know, number three. I think you have to care for the other side, the, the customers. It's not about yourself. So if you treat your customers well, then you they'll they'll always be there, and that's your business. You know. Do business with yeah. people you trust. Yeah. Um, have conduct business with with integrity, yeah. and always think about your customer uh, first and foremost. And always, um, thank thank you for your time. 
Thank you for flying all the way for, here from Singapore. And thank you for imparting your insights and your wisdom, Richard. I'm sure everybody would have um, appreciated your thoughts. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks hearts. a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.